good to see all of you. It's good to see this side get balanced out for a while there. I thought the building was going to tip over you. Everybody was favoring this side. That's okay. We are in week three of our series called The Good Work. Uh, we've been looking at uh, uh, the book of Nehemiah and that story. And it, it, coming out of last week, um, I, I, I want to... Last week we ended right there in, in chapter 2, verse 18, where the people were encouraged and said, you know what, we will help you build the wall. And it says the good work began. Now, here's a principle I think it's important to understand before we move any further. Anytime God leads you to do anything good, meaningful, generous, lasting, eternal, you are promised some things. And so right off the bat, just... Grab you, start filling in the blanks right now. Ralph notes, you want to go, go ahead and get your notes out. Here we go. Here are three promises. Three promises that you can expect once you start doing the good work that God has, the Bible says, that was prepared for us in advance. Here's the first promise opposition. Opposition. Here's the second one obstacles. Are you encouraged yet? Mm -hmm. Here's the third one. Resistance. This is what you can expect when you begin advancing and doing something good for God, something meaningful, something... Listen, all through Scripture we see this from the very beginning, okay? You know, in the beginning, there's Adam and Eve, and here comes the serpent. Um, Moses had to deal with Pharaoh. Uh, David had to deal with, well, the whole lot, there's a list, but this, we'll say Goliath. That's the you know easiest one to think of. Jesus came on the scene and he had Herod and the Pharisees and the other Jewish leaders and Judas, um, the devil himself and the demons. I mean, Jesus had a bigger list, but you know, when you're God incarnate, you tend to have a lot of opposition. Uh, what I'm saying is you shouldn't be surprised by this idea. And in the story that we've been looking at in the book of Nehemiah, his sort of foil in the story or the opposition comes in the form of two guys named Sambalat and Tobiah. Sambalat and Tobiah. Um, just to refresh, remember Nehemiah, uh, it, back in, in, in the 500s BC, Israel was taken captivity by by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and there's some changeover in power, but, but they're still in captivity for about 140 years later. Um, uh, Nehemiah hears of some news. Now, a few decades before that, some about 50,000 they had let go back. But when they when the Babylonians took over, they, they tore down the walls, they ruined, they tore down the temple, burned all the gates, I mean, they destroyed Jerusalem. And, and Nehemiah, we find him in the beginning of his story and, and about 140 years after the captivity, he, his brother comes to town and he says, how are things going back in Jerusalem? I heard some people went back and he says, yeah, it's terrible. The gates are all burned. There's no security. There's no, you know, it's just, it's like the Wild West. It's, I mean, he didn't use those terms. That's, that's my interpretation. But he says, it's just terrible that everything's in ruins. There's no leadership. There's no anything. And, and we talked about in week one how Nehemiah did three things. He sat down and cried. And then he knelt down and prayed. And then he stood up and acted. And, and it's important to, to cry. It's important to allow God to break our heart for certain things. I mean, he let God break his heart. Even though Jerusalem was a thousand miles away and he was the cupbearer of the king, King Artaxerxes at this point, the king of Persia, he's getting to stay in the palace and eat the king's drink and food. It, it was so he could make sure it wasn't poisoned. So there's a little bit of, you know, risk there. But he got to eat everything the king ate. I mean, he's, he's living that life, but he allowed God to break his heart. Last week we talked about how he went before the king, how he kept himself in prayer for over four months, prayer and fasting, and then went before the king and said, you know, listen, it, it, well, he, he actually just went before the king and didn't put on a, a facade and a face. And the king said, what's wrong with you? You've never been sad in my presence. And he said, well, my land, my homeland is terrible. It's ruined and people, they need help. And the king says, well, what do you want me to do? 
He said, you know, if I found favor in your sight, if, if you can do it, he said, will you send me to Judah? Will you send me back home and let me rebuild the city? And the king says, yeah, you can go. And he says, well, good. Now I need a letter of protection to make sure I can sa tra safely travel. And I need a letter to the, to the head of your, you know, uh, forest so that they, because I need timber. And the king says, okay, sure. And he gives him everything he needs and he gets back. And we see him begin to have some, a little bit of, we, we know, we, we start hearing those two names, Sam Ballad and Tobiah, and we start hearing that they, they don't like what's happening. They're, they're, they're not Jewish. They're just the ones, they're sort of living there or occupying. And they're not happy that anybody's coming back and they're doing anything positive. And so they're not happy that this guy's coming with permission from the king. And, and it starts to, uh, the, he, he comes back and, the, and at first the people sort of seem like, we're not sure, you're just one guy, whatever. And he says, listen, I gotta tell you, we talked last week about how, he, how to deal with discouragement that comes when that happens, when opposition comes. I, I, I wanna jump into, we're, we're gonna not skip over chapter three, but if you, if you wanna go read chapter three, there's a detailed description of how Nehemiah, once, once chapter two wraps up and the people say, we're with you, we'll do it, let's start the good work, let's do it. You can see where, it doesn't tell us that Nehemiah, but he's in charge at that point. I assume it's Nehemiah. There's all these assignments made of these different family groups and different ones that are building certain parts of the city. And so in chapter three, they begin to rebuild all of the gates and it lists it for us. It tells us that they, they worked on the sheep gate. Now, I, I know when I read these, you're gonna think, okay, you're, I know Pastor Paul, your sense of humor, you're making, I'm not making these up. You can go read it, it's there, okay? But there was the sheep gate. Then there was the fish gate. And, and, and if you're like me, when I was reading these, I kept thinking, now, which, where do I want to live? I have to live in Jerusalem. <laughs> so far, I haven't found a place because I don't want to live near the sheep gate or the fish gate. <laughs> then there was the, the old city gate or, or the Mishnah gate. Uh, then there was the valley gate. Okay. Then there was the dung gate. That's a no for me. That's a, either sheep, fish, or dung. I'm pretty, I'm out. The fountain gate, the water gate, that was over in the uh, Arlington, no, like the near Georgetown part of Jerusalem. I've been there. Um, it's old, but it's still nice. Uh, the horse gate, and then the inspection gate. You had to go there once a year uh, to get your car uh, approved. Here's the thing, and it tells us this in chapter three. He wasn't dealing. Now we know we know Nehemiah himself was nothing but the cupbearer. He had been raised in captivity, and, and he was a cupbearer to the king. He wasn't a prophet, priest, or king, a contractor, nothing. He had no skills that we know of that would qualify him to do what he was doing, and yet he stood up and said, somebody's got to do something. Well, when he gets there, he's working with people. You know, you'd think God sends him to Jerusalem. Certainly he's going to get there, hook up with all the contractors, and then they can get to work. That didn't even happen. The Bible tells us in chapter 3, here's who he had to work with. Goldsmiths, perfume makers, and merchants. So he kind of doubled down on this whole kind of plan. Here's, that's who he's got building. But here's the thing, they began to make progress and they began to build parts of the wall. They began to go up and they're building the gates. That's the first step to, to build security. And, and you begin to see in chapter three, you can, you can read as you read and all the different family members, this family did this and this family, and you see all this participation and you can, you can almost sense the, 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 the sort of morale lifting and as they're, they're saying, you know, maybe, maybe we can actually do this. And then comes the promise. You remember the promise? Did you write those down? Opposition, obstacles, and resistance. Here we pick it up in chapter four. Chapter four, verse one. Sam Ballad was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumer Sumerian uh, army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make
make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that. Now, now pause right here for a second here in verse two. There's a couple important things to understand. First of all, he calls them feeble Jews. Now, that, that word's translated, obviously, from the Hebrew into our word, feeble. It's the closest thing we have. But the word, that, the Hebrew word that he uses there is the same word that you would describe a flower that had been cut. Now, I know some of you, and I, I shouldn't stereotype like this, but I'm guessing most of you ladies, uh, know, Jeff likes to get flowers too, but, but most of you ladies like flowers. And that's something that I wrestle with all the time because I like I know Annie likes them. I know when I surprise her on certain, especially the good Hallmark holidays that are made up. Uh, you know, those, uh, you know, she likes it when I'll, when I'll you know, uh, go to go to proflowers.com, you know, and because and, I always got a good promo code. There's everybody on the radio, and I can just pick a name, and then and Julie will give you some kind of discount. And, 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 and I can get those, and they do a great job. They, it's not a, advertisement for proflowers.com unless this is seen on Facebook and you want to give me like a year free, that would be great. Uh, but, because they always seem like they're a really good deal and cheap until you do like I do and wait till two days before the Hallmark holiday happens and you have to pay for like the shipping that's like twice the amount of the flowers because you got them on sale. And then they come in and they sit in that vase and they look so great for a couple of days. Sometimes they'll last even longer but it's like the minute you cut that flower off from the thing it's growing from, it begins to die. And you can sustain it sometimes longer than others, but basically it's like on the clock. It's not gonna grow. I've never put a flowers in a vase on the table and had it root up into the table and start growing again. Now we got a tree stone that's done that, but not outside, but it's still into something, you know. Once you cut a flower, the Hebrew word that Sandal uses to make fun of the Jews here is that same word to describe a flower that's on this, this kind of it's terminal. It's like, it's, this one's on its way down. It's feeble. It's like a wilting flower. It's basically what he was calling them. A wilting flower. And he says, he makes the statement, he says, do they think they can build a wall in a single day just by offering a few sacrifices? Now, here's what I gather from his question. This tells me they were offering sacrifices, right? So they weren't just building the wall back. Nehemiah had them gathering for worship. They were kind of getting back into their heritage and what they were, what they're, and that means somebody was having to teach them. How long ago did they go into captivity? You remember? 140 years ago. It's a good chance none of these guys living were around then, which means somebody, a good mom and daddy, somebody had passed on, this is what God told us to do. And Nehemiah says, listen, we're going to build, but we're also going to start off, remember, remember how great grandma told us about the instructions that were given? And this is how we're to worship. And they began coming back together. They began offering sacrifices. So they're not only mocked for the fact that none of them have the skill set required to do what they're doing, but they're being mocked for their faith, they're being mocked for the fact that they actually believe in something bigger than themselves. And he says, that, how can they make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Sam Ballard is looking from the outward appearance and saying, how can they make anything out of something so bad, something that's been ruined? Can I tell you, I've had people look at me because I've made some mistakes. I have people look, I have good friends. You ever one of those friends, maybe, maybe you don't have this, maybe you run to a friend and they find out that you actually go to church and they knew you back when? I have friends that knew me in college and they say, you're doing what? <laughs> you're pre, you're what? You're a pastor? Well, that's great. And you can hear it in their voice. Here's what they're saying, if I could put it in Sam Allen's words. How are you a pastor when you're nothing but a pile of rubbish? When your past was that. There was something at work here bigger than just building a few walls. Now, it's not bad enough Sam Ballard's piling on. He's got Tobiah, and I see Tobiah as 
kind of his little hype man. <clears throat> He's not, he doesn't have as many words, but he kind of jumps in there at the end. I, I don't know this, I don't know this, but in my mind, I picture Sam Ballot's a pretty big guy because he's pretty free with his little insults and stuff. I think Tobiah was kind of a lot smaller and he kind of stood right behind Sam Ballot and kind of said, yeah, <laughs> what he said, you know, he kind of, because listen, it says, verse three, Tobiah the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked on top of it. It's not near as good as calling him a wilting flower. I mean, he, he's not quite as poetic. But he's kind of piling on, he's jumping in. And he's basically saying, even what you're doing, it's so, it's so terrible. Bunch of goldsmiths and perfume makers, well, how do you know how to lay brick? You don't know what you're doing. That thing would fall down if even a fox walked on it. I'll never forget going to uh, uh, Brazil back in 2005, we took a team of people and, uh, and I went for support and to help. Um, but we took a bunch of builders because we were building a, a, a new dormitory for this orphanage that was there. And, and so it, obviously we didn't take, some guys brought some tools, but by, by and large we had to do everything there. And so they had a pit there, the no, locals were mixing cement in, you know. And um, I thought, hey, I'm gonna go build a dormitory. And I, I did, if build a dormitory means take the wheelbarrow over to the pit, let them load it up with cement and take it to the guys who knew what they were doing. That's what I did. I did that over and over again. And, uh, and so they built these walls, but they didn't, they built them in sections and, and they were gonna come in later and put in the support that was gonna hold the walls together. But we were trying to get it up quickly and they were doing that. What we didn't know was there was a, a, a small herd. I say herd, that's probably way too much. It was maybe about four or five cows or such that, that roamed that area. And where we were building, our dormitory, we had the right to build it there, but we hadn't asked this herd if we were allowed to build it because it was in the middle of their path. Where they would walk from where they did something over here to did something, I don't know if they were going to drink, I don't know what it was, but there was a cow path through there and that's where we built the dormitory. So the first day the walls went up quick, man, we were putting them up fast and I, I kept thinking, that doesn't look very strong. In other words, we're going to come in tomorrow. We're going to put in the supports and we're going to, then it'll sure that all up. It's great. We came in tomorrow and when we did, the walls were flat. At least the ones that were in the cow path. Because the cows walked and they didn't have enough sense or, or stuff. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was obstinate, but, but, but they were on their path and they thought, who put this here? And they just kind of hit it and it just fell. When I read this scripture, I thought, I remember walls like that. Now, I don't know if this is the way the, the, the Jewish people were building their walls or not, but this is what Tobias said. Even a fox could jump on top of that and knock it down. You don't even need cows. Just knock it down. And, uh, and, and they're, they're doing that. Can I tell you that when you start doing something for God, you're going to have opposition and obstacles and resistance. It's going to be there. Yeah. You know, you... you you know, you, you decide for the first time in a long time, I'm, I'm actually going to go gather with God's people. You will be late. You will, I can tell you it's going to be whatever. I, I, I can guarantee you, when I, the, the more excited I am about something in God's word I want to share, I can guarantee you I'll get in a fight with Andy on Sunday morning about something stupid. It's just automatic. You know, you finally work hard and get out of debt, and that's when your car will break down. I mean, it's, it's, it's like you can almost count on it. You're doing something, it's been on your heart, and, and you try to tell one person about it, and they will probably say something to you wonderful like this. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You, know, you will get that sort of opposition. Just for the next few minutes, I want to give you some opposition truths. These are sort of principles or truths that, 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 about opposition. Here's the first one. Advancement invites opposition. When you begin to advance in doing what God's called you to do, or, or like again, doing the good work that he's prepared for you in advance, when you begin to advance, it's actually an invitation for opposition. So here's the point. Don't be surprised when you face opposition. You should almost look for it. That doesn't mean be pessimistic, not be full of faith, but it takes more faith sometimes to withstand opposition than it does to just sail through and nothing ever go wrong. It's expected, you should almost expect it. Can I tell you when you expect it, 
And it's actually better for your feet because then it's like, oh, good, this, is, this means I'm advancing. It invites opposition. Here's the second thing, and it's sort of the other side of the coin to this one. Complacency repels opposition. So if you don't want to face any opposition, you don't want to face obstacles, you don't want to face resistance, can I tell you, Satan will leave you alone when you're not a threat. When you're not working for the kingdom and you're not doing anything positive for God, you're not doing anything God's called you to do, Satan will pretty much leave you alone. You go into that kind of complacency, that will repel opposition. If you, if you just don't want to fight opposition, here's the, here's the key. Here's the key to not facing opposition, resistance, and obstacles. Just coast. Uh, do your thing. Just be comfortable. Live comfortably. Um, just, you know, do you. Um, make sure when you do, you create like perfect Instagram moments about it, you know. Hashtag blessed. You know, kind of. I mean, you can go to church. Go to church. Gather. That's good. But make sure you don't engage. Don't participate. Don't, don't pray. Goodness sake, don't serve anybody. Don't give. Definitely don't want to do that. Don't, don't care in general. Make sure you do some spiritual things. It makes you feel better. Um, do just enough to feel good, not really enough to make any kind of difference. That will help you repel opposition. It'll be a lot easier. Because I can tell you the moment you actually step out in faith and begin to live like God's Word tells you to, you're going to engage in that. You're going to be a target. You're going to invite opposition. Here's a, here's a third thing. Opposition doesn't deserve a response. I, I, I started to ask this question before I gave you the answer. This is kind of backwards. But how, how do you respond if we follow, especially Nehemiah's example, how do you respond to critics, to haters, to naysayers, to doubters that, that, come, that are kind of opposed or give you resistance. How do you respond to them? Well, here's the answer. I just gave the answer. You don't. You, you don't respond. Not to them. If we look at what Nehemiah does in this next few verses, he doesn't respond to them at all. He doesn't defend it. He doesn't talk to Sam Ballot or, or Tobiah at all. Can I tell you there's a reason for that? Your response to opposition is not going to convert them. And, and, and this is why it's important to understand where the opposition is coming from and why it's coming. If the opposition is coming because you're moving forward in what God has told you to do, then you responding to the opposition isn't going to fix it. It's not going to take it away. The only thing that it does when you respond to opposition is validate it. You, you sort of let it know that it's fine. When I was in college, I wasn't going to tell this story. This is, this is not a positive story. This is part of my rubbish heap days. When I was in college, I loved going to uh, basketball games. When, when, when I was going, when the kids go to school, um, it was just a college, wasn't university. And now they got like 20 sports. They're, the, you know, Division II, NCAA, all this stuff. We were part of like the Suncoast Southeastern Regional Conference for Christian schools. It's, I don't know what it was. It had a long title. It had like, the acronym was like two miles long because it was something I'd never heard of. And, and we played other smaller schools. And we had a basketball team. They, they might have had, I think they had some other sports as we went, but that was it. So man, basketball games were big. If we went to basketball, that was the only thing on in town, you know. And so we went to basketball. We loved going to basketball games. Man, I, I've had to have, I keep, even though I know God's grace has covered his the blood of Jesus has covered all of my sins. I still, I think about some of the stuff I did in some of those games. I still ask God for it. I know God, you don't even remember what I'm talking about because you've cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. But I'm going to have to ask you one more time just, for, if, just in case you remember. Please forgive me. There was one school we played and it, I was talking to, uh, to Dr. Dan Riker uh, and found out he went to that school. Now, not at the same time. He's a little bit older than I am. But we were talking and he said something about school. He said, well, that school, that's near where I went. And he, I said, you went to Temple? He said, yeah. I was like, oh. And he laughed. He said, I know, because that rivalry was, even when he was there, it was there. But when we went to Temple, or especially when they would come, they would come. It didn't matter if we went to their games or if we, they came to our games. When they would introduce their team, we literally would turn our backs around and face the wall. That was actually the nice thing. One time somebody came and passed out a bunch of newspapers. These are papers they used to put the news in. 
and you, they weren't digital. You had to have like big papers. I'll explain it to y'all later. Um, it would, uh, and we would, somebody passed out a whole bunch of papers. And so when they started introducing our entire side, just all like had newspapers. Like that. It's like a wall of papers. And that, that was kind of mild. Um, there was one kid that played for them. He had red hair and freckles. And he was really good, actually. He could shoot the lights out. Every time he touched the ball, we began to chant, Obi, Obi, Obi. Because he, he looked just like little Obi from. The worst thing, though, was, was the referees. We would wear a referee. We had, at home games, the, the group of guys I hung out with my fraternity, we would sit underneath the basket of this one end of the gym. And so the referee was always kind of standing down there. And especially if there were free throws, he had to stand right next to us because he was kind of standing there. And let me tell you, it was merciless. I, I mean, it was like, I, I, many times I, I took off the glasses I had on and, and would walk over and, do you, do you need to bar these? Because you're missing a really good game, you know, and that kind of stuff. And we would, we would that was one of the nicer things. We would tan the refs. Here's why I sell it. This is how we knew our opposition was working, okay? Every once in a while, one of those players that we would sort of find a name and we'd start calling him a name. Now, unfortunately, Opie was like Nehemiah. He, he would ignore us the whole time. And after a while, we'd stop chanting at it because it didn't matter. But every once in a while, there was a player or a ref that would turn around and look at us and say something. And when they did, it was like, yeah, we got to them. It, listen, he, it made it worse. We began to oppose them even more because we knew their response validated what we were doing. It was like, oh, we're under his skin. Oh, this is working. If he's talking to us, he's not thinking about the game. He's not trying to play the game better. He's, you know, and some of you are like, what's wrong with that? Um, that's what the fans are supposed to do. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I still feel shameful for some of the things I used to say. But here's the point. You don't respond to opposition. All you do is validate it. All you do is let opposition know you're hearing and listening and it's affecting you. When you acknowledge critics, you give them power. I, I heard this this week and I like this. The people that boo the loudest are generally doing it from the cheap seats. In other words, they haven't invested a whole lot to be there. Um, they're, they're not really important unless you respond and then you give them power. And now they're speaking. You're allowing them to speak into your life. Now, it, it's not easy to deal with opposition. It's not easy to not respond. I, thank goodness there's a delete button on every device I have. Because if I had hit send on everything I'd ever typed out, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. They would have revoked whatever it is that I'm allowed to have there now. But, but there are times where I want to, oh, and then no, I want to delete, 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 delete. That's, a, that's actually another name. The Holy Spirit is comforter, counselor, paraclete, deleter. It, that, that's in the Greek. You have to look deep in the Greek to see that, but the Holy Spirit helps me to lead a lot. It's not easy to deal with, especially when it's somebody you know really well. Oh, see, I can tell that look on some of your faces. See, opposition can come from people who love you. I should have put that in quotes. Or people who just care. They, they're trying to look out for you. Now, don't get me wrong. You need somebody that's godly and that has counsel that can speak into your life and maybe tell you, hey, you need to rethink that idea. But I'm talking about opposition that's coming in opposing to a God thing that you know without a shadow of a doubt is something God's called you to do. Well, I told you uh, last week, I think it was, we were, I was talking about when we started uh, Ray Ministries and how when we started that, we had no idea God was going to take it and do what it was. But when we started it, I was really excited about it and I thought it was great. And I went and met with a... Uh, Somebody who had been a leader I'd looked up to, somebody that was a family friend, somebody that knew, and I went and I was so excited to go tell him because I thought I can help him. He was in a position that was that was sort of over all the kind of worship leaders all over the, in, in the denomination, and I thought, well, this is what we want to do. I can I can really help, and so I went to him and said, this is what we, God has called us to do. Anything we can do to help. I thought I was being very gracious, and he looked across the desk for me and said. Well, that sounds good. I mean, 
you'll do okay like at least once, but you have enough friends that they'll bite you once. But it, that, it, it won't last much longer after that. And I was, I can remember, I would rather have had somebody I didn't even know to criticize me than somebody I loved and trusted and thought a lot of. It's really hard to respond or not respond, I should say. When somebody looks at you and says, you know, when you know it's a God thing and you know it's something God spoke to you and you know you're doing something good and they look at you and say, don't be stupid, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? Definitely don't quit your day job. How are you gonna, how are you gonna foster kids? You can't even handle the kids you have. How are you gonna, you're, you're gonna lead a life group? Who do you think, you don't know enough you, you think you know as much as Victor? How are you going to do a life group? Here's something you tend to hear from opposition. You're too, like T-O-O. And you can just fill in that blank. You're too old. You're too young. Now, I don't know why I looked at Barbara and said too old and looked at John and said too young. That was not intentional. <laughs> it was just a left-right. Don't read into that. You're too inexperienced. You're too busy. Can I tell you, Nehemiah, he, he, he didn't answer his critics because the critics aren't the one that called him. The critics aren't the one that met with him. The critics aren't the one that he said. When he said, I went to the king, he didn't say, and everybody thought it was a great idea. He said, the gracious hand of God was upon me. God has called me on this task. And so, who do you answer to? You answer to the one who called you. Instead of engaging and stepping down to the lower level of Sandal and Tobiah, he turns to the higher level. And this is what he prays in verse 4. Now, let me just, before I even read this prayer, let me just, let's, let's, let me give you a little disclaimer here. This is before the cross. Nehemiah does not have a concept of grace, forgiveness. Nehemiah would need to come to your life group, Victor. And, and talk about forgiveness. Because he didn't have a clue about that stuff. He, all he knew was the only way to get rid of something ungodly is to get rid of it. This is what he prayed. Then I prayed. Doesn't talk to Sam about Tobiah. Turns to heaven. Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads. And may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. That's his prayer. Now, as ungraceful as that prayer is, I'm so glad that Jesus, when he came on this earth, said, and when you pray, pray like this, and gave us some better instruction. And I think that's a reason, because I think that is sort of an Old Testament kind of model. David in the Psalms prays that all the time. The only way he knew to get rid of sin was to get rid of the ones doing the sin. I mean, David just says, God, those people hate you. Wipe them out. The heaven, there's a, a whole chorus we used to sing, and I used to sing it. I thought, gosh, that sounds terrible. It's like the heavens, well, the earth melts like wax in front of you. Like it's like it's, it's super Old Testament. And, and that was the concept they had. There was no concept of eternal life or forgiveness or grace, mercy. The, the people, Victor and I share that gifting. We have an Old Testament gifting. No mercy, pretty much at all, for anything unrighteous. It's like really hard. Tons of compassion, but we struggle with mercy. So we're like Nehemiah. I'm starting to feel better about myself. I'm feeling better every day. He says, God, but here's the, here's the, the, the thing. It's not so much about what he prayed, but the fact that he turns to God. And he doesn't answer them. He doesn't respond to them. He says, God, they are mocking your workers, your people. And this is what verse 6 says. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Here's Nehemiah's plan. Pause to pray and then get back to work. Pause to pray. Say, God, can you hear what they're saying? Don't even blot out their sins. I wish I could tell you I've never prayed that. 
And then I stopped and the Holy Spirit convicts me and I say, oh God, please don't, you know, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> but then after, after that, this is what happens, verse 7. When Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites, notice how it's increased here, heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired. They were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Here comes another round of opposition, except this round of opposition. Uh, it comes with threats. It comes with threats of violence. It comes with saying, listen, we're going to actually fight against you. Now, now it's not just little mocking, little cute phrases and making fun of you. It's not just about discouraging you. We're going to physically come against you. So Nehemiah, what does he do? He doesn't even respond at first to the threat. He goes back to prayer. He goes back to prayer. He says, we prayed to our God and guarded the city. We say this, I say this all the time. Uh, I've said it probably two or three times just in this series. We pray like everything is up to God and we work like everything is up to us. There's nothing wrong with the book. When I have a headache, I pray, God, I need you to touch my head. And then I take some iron growth. That's not a lack of faith. That's doing what I know to do. Doing what, you know, that's, that's all right. Now, if you're opposed to ibuprofen, you can take time. It's okay. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? It's not, sometimes I think we think if we do anything practical or anything that, that God, do you know what common sense is? It's what God gave you. God created you. He made you. He gave you that for a reason. He gave you that sense of right and wrong. That's a created God thing that he's given you. Uh, the prophet, Jimmy Cricket, would say, it's your conscience. Some of you just wrote that down. He wasn't a prophet. Don't write that down. That... Listen, the, the whole idea that, but they're not in conflict. Conf... Hmm. I watched my face this morning. I can't do anything with it. The whole idea of conflict, of those two in conflict, is not biblical. We constantly see things like this where, where they prayed and then they worked, and they prayed and then they worked. And one does not negate the other. One doesn't conflict with the other. They were both spiritual and practical. He said we prayed to our God and then we defended ourselves. We made sure that the families weren't attacked. And here's the un another truth about opposition that, that's tough. The last one. Opposition produces discouragement. Opposition produces discouragement. Verse 10. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build a wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. This level of opposition began to affect how they were working and thinking. And suddenly the work that they were so enthused and had so much energy and just God was just, they were excited to, Suddenly now it's, we're tired and we're worried. And they, they had all kind of external opposition, but can I tell you the worst kind of opposition is this, the kind that comes when it gets inside of you. See, up until now they hadn't doubted their ability even though they weren't qualified. They had not doubted God's ability even though they hadn't seen him in 100 years. They didn't really, they're just trusting the stories they had but they had faith and they believed and yeah, I'm a perfume maker, but I can build a wall and they were going to it. And then when this opposition comes and they're actually threatening to take their lives, suddenly discouragement sets in. And those same people with enthusiasm and confidence begin to say, well, we're tired. I don't know if we can do this. I'm not sure we can get this done. Can I tell you the internal opposition when you forget who you are can be the worst. 
Your external opposition will only be as loud as your internal insecurities will allow them to be. We always think that the heat turns up. It doesn't really change. It's always the same. It's just that internally we begin to forget. So here's how. Let me just close with this. This is how you deal with discouragement. Here's how you deal with discouragement. Because the moment that even Nehemiah started to battle his own insecurities, it took the focus. He had to take the focus off of himself and back on God. This is what it says in, in verse 14. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. That's probably the most powerful statement he could have made. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Now, how do you tell people who are discouraged, who are telling you they don't even think we can get it done, how do you tell them to fight? You tell them to remember the Lord. Here's the two ways to deal with discouragement. Number one, remember who God is. Remember who God is. He says, remember the Lord who is great and glorious. You take the focus off of yourself and onto God. You remind yourself this isn't even our battle. This wasn't our idea. This was a God thing. God has called us to this task. God has called me to this mission. God has called me to do this work. Before I was ever born, when he was knitting me together in my mother's womb, according to Psalm 139, he had a book and he wrote down his plans for me. These are God plans. These are things that he wrote down. I need to remember who he is and that he is with us and that he is for us. I need to go to the scriptures and read that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I need to go and remind myself of what Paul said when he said, if God is for me, who can be against me? Who can ever separate me from the love of God? Nothing, he says. No one. Remember the Lord your God. And, and I think it's important here that Nehemiah, we have in the, in the scriptures, he says, remember the Lord who is great and glorious. But I think there's so much more in that statement. Because again, this is generations that had not heard and known. And so I have to believe that when he said, remember the Lord, I, I, I suspect they went, well, what do we remember? And he began to say, I, I'll tell you, I remember. I heard the stories about Moses. I remember the stories about when God led them around, not the normal path, he led them around right into like a box canyon kind of where they were trapped and there was nothing there but the Red Sea. And Pharaoh's armies were bearing down on them and God sent in something that confused the armies. He opened up the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. And as the armies of Pharaoh chased them across the, the same sea, he then, in, he then buried the entire army of Pharaoh in the Red Sea. Have you not heard the stories of when they got in the wilderness and they were hungry? And God just said this stuff. They didn't even know what to call it. They called it, what is it? Or manna. And it just appeared on the ground every day and it fed them. And when they got there, their diet was way too carb heavy. They were like, we need something. And God sent quail. He sent quail. I've had to learn to skip the manna these days. But God has quail too, so that's good. I didn't expect you to amen on the low carb answer, but that's okay. God, I need to have a new series. God is the God of low carbs. We're going to do that one day. Can I tell you, here's what we got to remember. Not only who God is, but what God has done. I, I told you just a couple weeks ago, we worship God for who he is. But we know who he is because of what he's done. If we look back to these to Israel, just leaving Egypt and going through the wilderness, and just read the book of Exodus, when, when we start, he tells, he tells Moses, tell them I am. Because Moses says, well, who do I say sent me? He says, tell them I am. That's enough as it is, but I heard somebody say this in real life. He basically said, I am blank. And then, over the next 40 years, he began to fill in the blank. Because as they saw what he did for them, 
than they knew who he was. All they knew at first is he's Jehovah, he's Yahweh. That's it. But then you begin to see the other names of God begin to develop. As he healed them, they went, oh, he's Jehovah Rapha, my healer. As they went to war because the enemies were attacking him, they went, oh, he's our banner, he's Jehovah Nisi. As they needed provision, they said, oh, he's Jehovah Jireh. Notice God didn't say, this is who I am, memorize all these names. I love the names we have on the tapestry in the foyer by our missions table that was, that was made by ladies from Iran or Iraq. Iraq. There, and, and it's all, you go look at it, it's all those names of God. But God didn't say at one point, now write this down, not even to Moses when he was writing stuff down. He didn't say, listen, now I'm going to tell you all my names. You need to memorize these. No, he did. He said, I am, and then he did. And as he did, they went, oh, he is. And they began to fill in the blank. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what you're going through or where you are, as God fills in the blank, you will know how to worship him. You will worship him for who he is, but you'll know who he is because of what he's done. And when Nehemiah looked at them and said, remember the Lord, he was saying, remember who he is and remember what he has done. Here's a, a, another principle. You want to just, an extra one. You don't want to, I don't have a blank for you. You want to fill it in. The greater the opposition against you, the greater the opportunity for God to fight for you. When you can get that mindset and understand that my opposition is not opposition, it's opportunity. There's actually a verse that says this if you choose to memorize it. I promise your connection card will not um, explode in 10 seconds if you choose not to accept this mission. James, first chapter, verse two says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider it an opportunity for joy. Consider your opposition an opportunity for joy. Here's why. For, when, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Let it grow. Let it grow. I can't finish the rest of that. I need to rewrite that. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Anybody want to be in that place? I, will, I long to be in that place that the Apostle Paul talked about. When he said, I am content in everything, whether with a lot or with nothing. If I have plenty to eat or nothing to eat, I'm content. If I have... You know, lots of friends or no one. If I'm alone, I'm content. How do you get to that place where you need nothing? Well, it takes opposition, which is an opportunity for God to bring you great joy. Because when your faith is tested, your endurance grows, and when that grows, and when it's fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So remember the Lord today and keep fighting to be debt free if that's what God's called you to do. Remember the Lord today. Keep fighting for that marriage that seems like it's hopeless. Remember the Lord and keep fighting that addiction will not win. Remember the Lord and fight. Remember the Lord and fight. Because the greater the opposition against you, the greater the opportunity God has for victory. There were plenty of victories in some of the wars we've seen in, in, in past history. And, and back, I think, to World War II, really, where we kind of have those battles sort of labeled and, 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 and we, we know them by even certain dates, whether it's D-Day or the Battle of Normandy, or, you know, those different kind of things. You notice that there's not a lot of big memorials and memories of little minor skirmishes. It's the big victories we tend to celebrate. It's the big battles that tend to actually be something that's, that's has an importance and, and is momentous on some level. Can I tell you, if you're worried and you're trying to play that sort of comfort game and stay away from opposition, 
You probably won't have any opposition, but you also won't have any big victories either. If you want to stay safe, stay comfortable. But if you allow God to use you and not be afraid of the opposition and understand that opposition is going to come, I'm not going to be surprised, but when it does, I know I'm moving forward. I'm advancing and doing what God's called me to do. And the bigger the opposition, the bigger the opportunity for God to do something. For God to win a battle that will be momentous. I want to win battles that my great-grandchildren will still talk about and encourage their faith and say, do you remember that story of great-grandpa when he faced that and God was victorious? I want to I wanna be somebody that we read about in Scripture who faced Goliaths who faced things that were so giant that were impossible and God won victories. Not to exalt me, but I want to leave that kind of legacy. Sometimes the opposition we fight and we face is coming because we're at a place where we need to make a decision. And there are some of you, maybe here today, maybe watching now or later that you feel like everything is opposing you and it's because you know there's a decision you need to make just to follow God in the first place and you're fighting that opposition that opposition has a name well the opposition doesn't but generally that feeling that tension you're feeling is actually coming from the Holy Spirit and it's called conviction and it's not really coming from any kind of enemy it's coming from Something inside that you know you're supposed to make a choice to follow God. You know you're supposed to make a decision. So I, I pray for some of you today that you understand that's something you need to choose. I have talked to people in the past that know they need God. They know they have a need for God. They know, but they know that when they accept God, that that there's going to be that, that there's going to be some change. They just know. They know there's some things they're doing that they know deep down. That thing that God has placed in them, that that conscience, that's literally the Holy Spirit that's convicting and drawing them, is saying, you know, you know, when you accept Christ, He says, I'm going to make you a new Christian. Jesus didn't die on a cross to make you better. He died to make you new, to make you a new creation. And there are sometimes we can kind of fight. Because we don't want to be new. We don't want to change. We like living where we are and what we're doing. But can I tell you, it is not worth your soul to live comfortable. Whether you've never made that decision or whether you've made that decision, but maybe you're just living in that comfortable place. When you're happy being a convert, but, but a disciple, that's for other people. And he's calling you to a higher level today. He's calling you first to make a choice to follow him, to follow actually what he teaches and what he says to do. And then he's calling you, some of you that have made that choice, to actually listen, to seek him, to hear from him, and to do the work he's called you to do, to do the good work that he has prepared for you in advance. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have prepared a work for us to do, that you've got a purpose for every single one of us. God, I, I, I ask you today to not only show us that and reveal it to us, but help us as we face opposition, Lord. God, help us to see it as an opportunity for you to win the biggest battle of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the battle you won on Calvary that conquered death, hell, and the grave. Lord, today we choose to accept you, to follow you, to walk in the path you have laid for us. Lord, we, we choose for you to be the Lord of our lives, to be the owner, the supreme authority, the one that we follow. Forgive us, Lord, for things that we maybe have done that we shouldn't have done or for things we should have done and didn't do. God, cleanse our hearts as we turn our hearts towards you, as we change direction and 
and repent or just simply stop following multitudes of wrong ways and follow after you. You are the truth, the way, the life. We choose to follow you today. God, as we follow you, call us to something higher. Call us to not just make a, a choice and wear a label, but to, to be someone who does the work you've prepared for us to do. Help us today to see those opportunities and to act on them. Thank you, Father.